The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, welcome to Beyond Energy Efficiency, Behavior Change Tactics for the Pollution Prevention Community. I'm Laura Barnes, the um, Executive Director of Glipper. I'll be moderating today's webinar. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Susan Mazur Stoman, who directs the Behavior and Human Dimensions Program at the um, American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy where she's the co-chair for the Behavior Change or an Energy Efficiency Conference and conducts qualitative research on behavior change and energy usage. She joined ACEEE in 2011. Prior to joining ACEEE, Susan worked as an adjunct professor in the California State University System and also ran her own consulting firm, Indicia Consulting, doing ethnographic research for Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory on cool roof retrofit rebates, among other clients. Susan earned both a Master of Arts and a Doctorate of Cultural Anthropology from the University of California, Riverside, and her Bachelor of Arts in Cultural Anthropology from San Jose State University. Um, I do want to note that um, presentation slides will be made available sometime tomorrow. Um, I'll be sending out a link in a follow-up email, um, so you'll have access to those after the presentation is over. Um, we are also recording this webinar today, and that archive will also be available. Um, sometime tomorrow, depending on how long it takes to, to actually run the archive when I, after the webinar concludes today. Um, and again, you'll be getting a follow-up email um, with the link to the archive if you want to go back and watch it again or share that link with, with some of your coworkers. So um, with, with that in mind, um, Susan? Um, you can go ahead and start. I will be moderating. Will we be taking questions at the end? Um, and uh, and go ahead and put them in as you uh, you can put them in. You can put them into the question dialog box as we go along, and I'll I'll read them off at the end. Um, and Susan, I'm getting um, complaints from people that they can't see the full slide. Are you in? Um, slideshow mode I'm in slideshow mode is that a hmm is it shouldn't better? be a problem it's, it's for some reason it's cutting off the slide on the side we had that problem briefly I think on the other um, I think that's actually from your end because we had that somehow and it was an issue with the presentation so yeah well as I say except that we're looking at your yeah we're looking at your screen Hold on one second. let's oh, see here let's okay. see here um, uh, let's see if I can show my application. Let's see. Let's try this. How's that? Nope, it's still cutting off. Okay. Um, let's see here. Let's now I can see the other. Now I can see the other half of the slide. <laughs> okay, which, which half are you talking about? I can now see, I could see the left side before, now I can see just the right side. What if we do both screens? How's that? I think that's that seems to be working. Okay. Oh, so. you know, I wonder if, okay, that's interesting. All right, does that seem to work? I think so. Um, is that good for everybody else? I'm... I'm guessing so because I'm seeing. I mean, I'm, I'll be. I'm seeing what they're seeing. So I think that I think that'll work. Okay. So yes, I'm getting yes. Thank you. It will have to do. So yes, I think it'll work. <laughs> it'll have to do. I mean, <laughs> I, well, I yeah. I think I think it'll work. I think it's going to work just fine. Okay. Yeah, I think we're good. Alrighty. So um, thank you for joining us. We're going to be talking today about um, mostly. We're going to be trying to take lessons learned in the energy efficiency behavior change field and applying them with some examples to the pollution prevention community. Um, my name is Susan Mazur Stoman and um, I'm from ACEEE and I was also ably assisted by my research analyst Michelle Vegan who can't be with us today because she's uh, got a slight cold. Um, but what we're talking about today is coming out of my position at the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. Uh, we're a nonprofit 501c3, and we work to advance energy efficiency policies, programs, technologies, investments, and behaviors. Uh, we're based in Washington, D.C., and we've been around for about 30 years. 
and our focus is on end use efficiency in industry buildings, utilities, transportation. So we have what we call a cross-sectoral approach. And um, our research is also at the national, state, and local level. Our funding typically is uh, foundations, some contract work and government grants, uh, conferences and publications. Um, the Behavior, Energy, and Climate Change Conference will be this coming November in Sacramento, California. And it alternates between California and DC, and that is the conference I'm a co-chair for. So www.acee.org, there's lots and lots of, of material and resources there for anybody. And we'll also, I'll repeat that later and talk to you about how you can best access some of those materials. So one of the questions I'm often asked is, what exactly does the Behavior Human Dimensions program work on? And one of the ways I use to describe it is that we're a lab where we make and test tools for programs. Um, it's not necessarily just utility programs. We also work with, for example, affordable housing programs um, in multifamily behavior change. Um, uh, I'm working with heavy duty trucking currently. But I call this making crayons. In other words, we're trying to make tools that other people can then use and deploy in their own programs. Some of the ways in which we do this is by focusing on social science and looking at social science insights and techniques and then measuring them and verifying their impact under specific circumstances. Another way in which we work is trying to work with policymakers to help them understand the impact of decision making and their actions or inactions on a particular issue. And to this degree, we also explore, uh, where possible, the interaction effects of policies, programs, and human activity. We're really interested in sort of emergent effects, if you will. Our goal is to encourage and support the development and deployment of behavior-based energy efficiency programs and policies. And to, pro to this end, we promote the use of usability testing, user-centered design, and attention to the technology and behavior nexus. So some of our research areas, we are concerned with aspects of energy consumption and behavior change overall. And some of our questions include, uh, for example, the synergistic or emergent effects from combined treatments and how small individual effects may add up to large collective impacts. One of the ways I describe this is that our focus is on engagement. It's a bit of a buzzword, but it really helps people understand what we're doing. Uh, we work in a variety of contexts, and so this presentation hopefully is also to be understood as not just limited to one particular sector or context. In other words, we work with commercial, residential, institutional, um, and I'm sure that many of you guys do as well. We also work across sectors, as I mentioned before. We work transportation, buildings, industry, and agriculture. So for example, this last year we did um, field work in the Deep South on energy efficiency and cons you know, consumer behavior in far with farmers, truckers, upper income residential, lower income residential, and um, I'm forgetting one, oh, small business. So we work across sectors. We define behavior as action or activity in the world. So one of the focus, our focus in our program is this type of behavior. We don't do a lot of attitudinal type surveys, for example. We are interested in conducting what we call direct, empirical observation and data collection, preferably in a naturalistic setting. We do ethnography and qualitative research primarily, um, though again, we do do some surveys, we do do focus groups, but our primary focus is on um, ethnography. And our goal is to have findings that are comparable, applicable, and practical. And so hopefully some of the things that we will be talking about today are things that you can take from our field to your field, just like folks in the energy efficiency field have taken from public health, for example. So among other things, our program, um, I really, this is again, I'm speaking from the behavior program specifically. Of course, all of these values are also shared among us at ACEEE. But um, we really seek to be locally and regionally oriented. Um, and again, this is something I'll be talking about in a second. We respect diversity of cultures and histories. Uh, we pay attention to issues of social equity and justice when devising our research and research design. And we aim to be as inclusive as possible in our outreach efforts. We also believe that there's a moral or ethical dimension to using the qualitative research te techniques and methodologies in that grounded methodologies or ethnography let people speak so we can hear people in their own voices. 
why do we do it? Why do we do what we do? Well, ultimately, as I said, we're trying to influence policy, but specifically in favor of more holistic solutions to energy problems. Um, in other words, problems are uh, intertwined culturally, socially, infrastructurally, uh, economically. There is not necessarily one aspect, and so we need to look at holistic solutions. We also believe that policy is people, and so anytime you enact policy, you're affecting people's lives, and that policy may not be a, a behavior driver, but it constrains behavior. And so good policy can in, encourage good behaviors. Uh, bad policy can sometimes become a barrier. Our goal in our program is to give people multiple positive pathways towards an energy efficient future. So there's not necessarily one right way, and this is going to be something that I'll repeat because I very much firmly believe that one of the things that gets in our way, at least as energy efficiency aficionados, if you will, is that oftentimes people want people to do things for their reasons, for the right reasons, as opposed to having the right outcomes. So good policy should respect individual choices and at the same time encourage optimal outcomes. So we're aiming to focus on what is the outcome that you're seeking rather than uh, did you do it in some sort of proper way or are people paying attention in the right way. Why are we focused on behavior specifically? Well, in the end, everything comes back to human behavior, even installed technology. In the energy efficient field, efficiency fields, uh, they've gone through several iterations of understanding this um, over the last 30 odd years. And after sort of the Carter years and the debacle where people made fun of him telling people to put on a, a sweater and turn their, you know, turn their heating down, um, the folks who are in the energy efficiency field really focused on technology as the way to just sort of subvert any kind of political inaction. And that doesn't really work because, again, if people don't choose to purchase, use, or abide by particular constraints that technology offers them, um, then it will not do the job. And I'll give you a quick example from on my own research in the Deep South. Uh, there are governors on um, heavy-duty trucks and many folks know how to get around them. Some people even just putting a broomstick and you know, kind of cranking in their engine. So you know, if people, oftentimes people will figure out a way around some type of constraining technology. And so if you don't have their buy-in, if you don't have their uh, understanding or their willingness, then it's irrelevant. Many of us are convinced that you know, if we just could find the right medium and the right type of data visualization, the right presentation, if we could just hit on the, the right focus, people will get it and they'll do what we want. But really what we need to do is to make issues concrete and visible. And this is really pertinent to energy, which is invisible. And we need to share this with people and, their, and the responses, that give them feedback to their actions in real time rather than abstractly and after the fact. Oftentimes what happens is people will um, be encouraged to do X or Y, and in time it's quite far separated from their ability to actually enact that action. So your utility bill insert might tell you to set your laundry on cold, um, but you won't be doing laundry for five days. And in those five intervening days, who knows what's happened? You're not going to remember. So our goals today in this discussion is to describe our growing interest in work on behavior approaches for sustainability, to summarize some of the behavior tools or strategies that um, we've talked about in energy efficiency, and to provide some examples of pollution prevention programs that use these same uh, behavior strategies. And I'm going to start just by saying a couple of caveats, things not to do, in my opinion, in our experience. One of the critical aspects to devising a successful program in any area of behavior change is that consumers, whether they're water en users, energy users, um, polluters, they do not need to have their cognitive load increased. And this is one of the biggest problems. People want people to change their behavior by thinking about their actions. And many of us have probably dieted, started a gym, tried to quit smoking, and we think about this stuff all the time and we still don't change our behavior. So simply adding one more burden to people's cognition and asking them to think about your particular thing 
is not going to affect their behavior. And by the way, we actually have a blog up. I think it's still, it's still posted. Our blogs rotate through, but uh, New Year's resolution blog, but it's about energy efficiency, and it's also about creating good habits and, and behavior change by Michelle, my colleague, and so that's kind of a fun thing to look at. So being educated, which should have quotes or air quotes around it, being made aware of, being taught to think about resources is not sufficient to affect change. It's one aspect, it's an important baseline aspect, but it will not actually affect change. Another thing to keep in mind is that people don't consume resources. Uh, this is a big issue, at least semantically, but it does affect people's behavior. In our world of energy efficiency, people believe people use energy, and that's not true. People wash their clothes. People run the dishwasher. Uh, people don't use energy. It's invisible. They use products and services. And by the way, I'm violating my own principles right now because I'm educating you. <laughs> so keep that in mind. One of the things I would like us to do is to stop relying on an outmoded model. We typically educate people in the hopes that they'll become better consumers. And there's a lot I could go off about this in terms of anthropology and, and um, Foucault and sociology and the discipline of consumers. And, and this is actually a big part of capitalism and a big part of our entire system is trying to actually trammel people into becoming good consumers, right? Appropriate consumers of whatever it is. And in fact, there, there's a lot of things that people can do with this, but most of us probably feel relatively uncomfortable and certainly don't want to see our own types of programs in that light. So instead, we need to look to ways that we can foster better outcomes through changes to people's social, natural, and built environments. So one of these ideas that comes, um, that we use a lot in energy efficiency programs these days is called community-based social marketing, or CBSM for short. And I may refer to it as CBSM, and uh, so, so just want to apologize ahead of time. It's not marketing. I mean, the CBSM programs themselves need a better name. It's really a research-based uh, way of applying a behavioral perspective to sustainability and energy efficiency programs. As a research-based approach, its focus is on addressing specific barriers to a targeted action in order to improve program de design efficacy. So what you need to do, first and foremost, local research. You need to find out, is there a barrier that's being overlooked before you even begin to educate people. And a quick example uh, from our own research, or not from our research, but from our meta review of research, is um, in New York they wanted to do uh, like an air conditioning program in certain types of buildings. And they found that people actually didn't have control over their heating or, air or cooling. It was centralized. They didn't even have tabs, like little switches to manually change their uh, heat or cool. So why would you be wasting time educating people when they have actually no control over their uh, heating or cooling. So programs have to consider specific local and regional issues for the deepest savings possible. And this is an energy efficiency, but I'm sure that, you know, that the same issues come up in terms of program pollution, and we'll be talking about that. I have a couple of very local and specific programs that we'll talk about it in a minute. And CBSM gives a set of steps for achieving this strategy. There's a process that one can go through, and uh, in energy efficiency, the progenitor of CBSM is Douglas and Kinsey Moore from Canada. He comes uh, to our conference, by the way, and does uh, workshops ahead of time, and is very well received. And, um, but CBSM has been used since the 1970s, again, in public health, uh, in development, in lots of different arenas. So some of our slides that we're going to be talking about offer some tools and examples drawn from the CBSM world. And for those of you who want to go into it in more depth, we have a recent white paper on CBSM, which is just giving the state of play and kind of a primer on CBSM. And it's called Reaching the High-Hanging Fruit Through Behavior Change, How Community-Based Social Marketing Puts Energy Savings Within Reach. So you can access it at acccorg slash white paper slash high-hanging fruit. So one of the first tools we have is commitment. And these are spoken, written, and public statements that reinforce self-image. And one example, the Sacramento Municipal Utility District found that people who made a pledge goal, uh, again, public pledge goal, 
achieve three times savings as the average in terms of their energy uh, consumption. The reason that this works is that we want to bring our behavior typically in alignment with public statements about who we are. And a great uh, example, a great sort of person who goes into this in depth is Grant McCracken, who calls these unities in his theory uh, Diderot's bathrobe. And if you look at Grant McCracken or Diderot's bathrobe or unities online, you'll be able to find what I'm talking about. But in a nutshell, what he's saying, the Diderot story is the philosopher from the 18th century who writes an essay about how you know, he's sitting in a shabby, his shabby room and his shabby study, and somebody gives him this beautiful new bathrobe. And he's sitting there in his beautiful, silk new bathrobe, and all of a sudden everything looks really shabby by comparison. So now he needs a new desk, and now the desk looks out of place, and he needs new wallpaper. And after a little while, he's completely redone his entire setting because he needed everything to kind of bring into harmony with the original disruptive element. This can also be misapplied. One of my favorite, most annoying examples in the energy efficiency world was you know, Pepco, which is my utility here in Washington, D.C., put up print ads at the D.C. metro stations and bus shelters with just random people and text script that said, I pledge to set my thermostat at 68. And I said, pledging or doing it wrong. Pepco could instead have a welcome kit for new accounts that would include a mail-in pledge. A mail-in pledge would still be a public statement. It would still be much more effective than, for example, a um, just a print ad campaign. Um, so if you were to do this with pollution prevention, one example would probably be um, if you have people who are signing up for new commercial water accounts, um, you might need to have somebody pledging that they would you know, abide by certain restrictions or what have you. And again, we're gonna, this is not one thing you do at one time. These are things that you do as part of a campaign. And we're gonna talk about this, how you structure your campaign a little bit, but you, this is one tool. Another tool is social norming. And it's based on the factor that nobody wants to be weird. Nobody wants to be the outlier. So one of the first things you wanna do is tell people, what is the norm? Um, it's not lying to people. You're, you're not telling people a norm that doesn't exist because people will figure that out quickly. But you share information about the community, perhaps, that around people or about how people's neighbors are doing. Uh, the example is uh, in the energy efficiency world is the O-Power uh, programs of enhanced billing that work with utilities, and they provide all sorts of information and incentives to people to save energy. And they have achieved really significant uh, results at scale. Um, so OPower will tell you how you're doing in comparison to your neighbors. So this makes behavior impacts visible and comparable. It lets people know, people know where they fall in, in a really very easy to read uh, graphic way. So there's more than one. There's C3 is one, OPower, Tendril. All of these send out uh, personalized reports and putting people into a context for their behavior. And I said I made fun of Pepco on the left side, so I'm going to give them credit for a really good website. I love their website. Um, it's an excellent uh, use of data and data visualization that lets people play around and also access uh, certain aspects of their energy consumption in an empowering manner. With numbers, norm number excuse me with norms, numbers matter. You want to show people uh, what are you comparing them to. I mean, people understand scale and again context and when you should use it is for example if there's a lack of motivation due to some sort of uncertainty about social acceptance I don't know do people really change their LED Christmas lights um, I like the old style ones well for one thing those are 30 cents versus three cents of a kilowatt hour but uh, for another thing I mean if people around you are changing to your LED Christmas lights all of a sudden it's becoming much more sexually acceptable well, another example that might uh, resonate with you guys is compost toilets. I come from Southern California, and I'm just waiting for my compost toilet days because we have no water. And uh, people are going to wake up one day, and it's going to be all of a sudden, uh, and we're going to be completely out of water. And um, until then, we lack the political will to shut people off from having things like you know, green lawns and Palm Springs. So we're clearly going to just hit a wall, and at that point, Compost toilets will probably become socially acceptable. But it would be nice to be able to get these to become a little bit more normative ahead of time. 
prompts, another tool, are visible calls to a specific, specific action. Did you turn out the lights? Again, you're going to have to focus on one action. One of the things I absolutely hate are those lists of 30 things you can do. How overwhelming is that? 30 things, 50 things. I mean, who's going to do those? Focus on one action. If you've got a program and, one, and there's one thing that's significant, you know, that's a big portion of, of the problem that's being caused, focus on that. Don't focus on everything. Don't you know, scattershot all of people's energies all, all over the place. One thing. These are not slogans, by the way. These are actual prompts to do something specific. We can deliver them through signage, feedback devices, in-home, web displays, smartphone apps, or reminders, simple door hanger on the back of your door. And it needs to happen in physical proximity to the targeted action. So if you want people to turn their laundry to cold, they need a door hanger for their laundry room that's going to tell them, did you set your setting to cold or tap? And by the way, it needs to be locally responsible as well, because in Southern California, if you have a tap setting, it's coming out of the ground at like 50, 60 degrees, and it, it works fine. If you're in a cold climate, then that might be irresponsible, or it might not give people the cleaning action that they're looking for. So again, activities and programs need to be local and specific. They also need to be deployed as close as possible to the timing of the action that you're seeking. And they require placement within the natural sequence of actions. So you have the batteries. Um, when you turn your clocks back and forth in spring to fall, people have now been inserting the batteries into your smoke alarm. When to use it? If a major barrier to completing an action is forgetfulness, as I mentioned before, seven days between getting a utility insert about changing your cold water setting and setting your cold water, um, then providing a prompt. Instead of setting, just educating somebody or telling them to do this, they should put a door hanger in and say, hang this door hanger you know, as a reminder for setting your temperatures to cold. So you can do this. Light switch stickers would be another example. Convenience. So oftentimes you find that behavior barriers are rooted in inconvenience, and that should not be sneezed at. Um, people often think, well, psh, your inconvenience is really nothing compared to my need for you to take this action or behavior change. Uh, but that attitude is not going to get the actual behavior change to happen. So oftentimes barriers uh, can be found in the built environment. For example, uh, and I found this actually in a hotel recently. I was willing to take the stairs, but I found this, the building was built like as a long corridor, and the only stairs were at either end of the corridor, which took me far away from the parking lot that I was trying to reach where my car was. So, I mean, it was a complete like mile lap out. Barriers can also appear in processes as we schedule our day, for example. You might want employees to bike to work more often, but have an 8 a.m. all-hands staff meeting every morning. Uh, that's not going to work. So you're going to need to adjust something to come in line with the values that you're espousing as a program, as an organization. And this, again, calls back to the unities concept. There are barriers that can be found in our shared infrastructures. So the classic one in urbanism is, you know, people would love to walk to lunch, but it's really dangerous. It's actively dangerous, that there's no sidewalks. Or there are huge berms. So convenience tools, understanding and rectifying uh, the barriers is, if there's a structural procedural barrier, then a convenience altering intervention should be implemented. So here's an example from the University of Minnesota. Um, there was an uh, installation at every workstation to address the inconvenience of reaching under a desk to turn off the power strip at the end of the workday. They installed an intermediary switch between the power strip and the outlet, which is laid on the desk, easy to reach. If you're asking people at the end of their day to scrabble under their desk and turn off, it's not going to happen. So make it easy. Remove that barrier. Now we're coming to some examples of a few programs that are pollution-oriented. Um, Save the Crabs is a campaign, uh, I believe it's still going on, the Chesapeake Bay, Washington, D.C. area. And I actually um, know the applied anthropologist who's worked on this, uh, Michael Paoliso, at the University of Maryland College Park. And he is um, uh, very invested in the anti-pollution um, uh, project of Chesapeake Bay Cleanup. So, as I'm sure everybody in this crowd knows, runoff is impacting water quality in the Chesapeake Bay. 
And in this community-based social marketing campaign, homeowners were asked to complete one specific action. Fertilize in the fall instead of the spring to reduce runoff into the bay. And the campaign was framed around not an abstract concept like don't fertilize or fertilizing is bad or pollution is a problem, but it was framed around the blue crab. The blue crab is, you know, a, a serious local cultural um, delicacy and a crucial regional industry. So the slogan became, save the crabs and eat them later. In other words, they'll be there for you to eat if you would do this one action. So there's an incentive as well. And they represented the request. And this messaging went through local chefs, local restaurants, local newspapers. It was promoted in restaurants and also by homeowners who could display signs reading, no appetizers were harmed in the making of this lawn. And the campaign also used a print and TV and media campaign. Keeping in mind, there's several things going on here. There's uh, outreach, there's media campaign, there's messaging, there's one activity, there's prompts that were handed out. Um, so post-campaign survey results showed those who were exposed to the campaign were significantly more likely not to fertilize their lawn in the spring. And anybody who wants to look that up, Michael Paoliso, P-A-O-L-I-S-S-O, has all the information. He's got the whole scoop on that. Scooping. Scooping the poop. So apparently Austin has the reputation for being a dog-friendly town. I was, have never been there myself. They have a lot of off-leash dog parks, nice weather, and public events that openly welcome canines. Downside. Austin has 60,000 pounds of dog waste every day. And this impacts local waterways with bacterial contamination, algal blooms, and fish kills. Let's find people who don't clean up after their dogs. That's a great idea. People always want to punish people. Um, let's punish people to get them to stop doing that bad thing. Unfortunately, if there's no officer to see it, there's no citation, and there's no compliance. There were actually several barriers to cleaning up the dog poop, and they included no convenient access to plastic bags, hey, I have bags in the back of my car, and I often forget to take them into, uh, into the grocery store, and plastic bags are basically charged or illegal in D.C. Trash clans weren't closed enough. The task is messy and dirty. I'm not going to really fix that. People's perception that one little pile is not really a problem. And my favorite, the belief that it's a natural or beneficial fertilizer. My dog is helping your lawn because he's pooping. So mutt mitt uh, stations were installed in city parks. We had 2,025 stations were installed. By 2010, over 150 stations available in 90 parks. Stocked with plastic bags that protect the hand and accompanied by a phone call, phone number for people to call to report violations or empty dispensers. Problems with water quality remained. People still wasn't enough, right, to install, to fix this one barrier, to fix some of the barriers, really didn't do it. So again, messaging was added. Keep in mind what I've said before. You need to stack these programs. You need to have messaging. I'm not saying that throw out the concept of education. I'm just saying education alone is insufficient. So you need to have a messaging campaign. You need to have local, locally oriented outreach programs. You need to solve the infrastructural uh, or convenience barriers. You need to add prompts. Things need to have, um, sort of more, again, a holistic solution. So they had, you know, 30-second television spot, a song, signage. In 2001, 75,000 mutt mitts were distributed to dispose of 37,000 pounds of dog waste. And by 2009, 2.4 million mitts had been distributed to dispose of 1.2 million pounds. And bacterial levels in local streams near off-leash dog parts have improved. Behavior change campaigns need to be multimodal, multi-channel, multi-message, multi-messenger. Um, these don't necessarily need to be expensive, but they need to be well thought out. And people need to start with the idea that one silver bullet is not going to be the answer. People need to be met on their own ground. They need to be, um, you need to use language that they understand and peer champions that they relate to. People are not necessarily going to just do it because an authority figure told them to. Um, People need to incorporate different uh, learning styles into their messaging, into their uh, messaging and outreach materials. 
not just privileging visual verbal. Um, many people are not uh, data illiterate. Um, there's a lot of people who can't read a graph or a pie chart or read you know, language particularly well. So there needs to be a sort of a, a sense of understanding who's your audience and how do you reach them. We need to move past pilot projects. Organizations in general need to step up and they need to deploy the types of programs we've shown to work at scale. And by this I mean there's a lot of information out there on this. CBSM, as I said, has been around for the 70s. Public health campaigns have used it. Um, you know, energy efficiency is using it. Um, there's other folks who are using it. Moving forward, we really need to just say, okay, commit. We understand. Pilot projects have been done. We can extrapolate. We need to just deploy. Oftentimes, behavior programs are seen as being cheap, right? Just tell people what to do. Super easy, no capitalization. I don't have to invest. It'll be, it'll be fine and dandy. In fact, a well-designed and properly implemented program will not be cheap, but it will be cost effective. So you have to weigh um, how much, what are the outcomes of the results that you're getting with an education campaign? Are they even measurable? Versus um, what kinds of efforts or uh, sort of thinking and, and investment can you put into a multimodal campaign such as I'm discussing? Can you measure outcomes and impacts? And then can you figure out if it's cost effective or not? And it's probably more likely that you can do it with these types of actual prompts and tools. So the key to success in any behavior change campaign is stacking a variety of means for reaching consumers of energy to get at those deep savings. And this is, again, I'm coming from an energy efficiency program. You'll have to take this to the pollution prevention program. But the idea is that we're going to stack these programs um, you need to have various components uh, to reach people, and that's going to be the key to effect, affecting change. There's a variety of people. There's a variety of ways to reach people, and there's a variety of people out there, and we need to use all of those to get what we want. So one of the key takeaways is that there's no one single program uh, that will magically turn people environmentally conscious. However, Behavior change programs in combination with one another, with attention being paid to local specific conditions and on the ground social realities, can boost program success significantly. I like this ad because if you look at the bottom, it says, the shoe works if you do. Right? There's no actual quick fix. If there's a message that I'm hoping is coming through consistently for those of us who work in other areas, is that there's no universal solution, and any program or policy must keep it local and respect the culture, practice segmentation of the target audience, use emerging technologies to reinforce good habits, use smartphone apps, use um, web displays. I mean, there's all sorts of things that people can do. Parse your data. We collect a lot more data than we realize. Parse it, understand your consumer behavior, right? look for insights. And focus on outcomes. What are your outcomes? How are they measurable? Um, how can you um, uh, bring that to scale? A couple of final thoughts. I would ask, in, you know, as you come away from this program, from this presentation, hopefully you just ask yourself, is your method working or should you adapt it? Understanding that small changes can have large impacts, especially if you have a lot of people doing them. Rather than scattering our efforts on you know, 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 different changes that people should do, pick one, pick two, and that's it. Right? Um, that's all you need to do. And then make sure everybody knows to do this one thing, like fertilize in the fall instead of the spring right? to affect you know, algae blooms and, to, and breeding habits of the blue crab. Take back culture change onto technolo technological innovations. Oftentimes these things happen without us really noticing that people have changed their, um, their life ways, their food ways, their work ways, their driving habits because of a change in technology. And if you're quick enough, if you kind of are paying attention, you can often see this kind of culture change in, in process in situ and uh, pin your need for behavior change to when people are already changing their habits. Look for local and indigenous solutions. Oftentimes people are already doing things that may be useful to you, may be great solutions. They may seem 
unsophisticated, they may seem um, out of the box or kooky, but they may work. And so really looking at the local and indigenous solutions before throwing them out. This is another one I've talked about in a different context, but it's a lot of fun just to think about. Again, I'm just throwing this out to think about. Oftentimes we forget how much people use um, ritual, lore, um, you know, riddles, rhymes, mnemonics to teach themselves new practices and processes. So sailing is a great example I like to use. When people know the red sky at night, uh, sailors delight. Red sky at morn, sailors be warned. And you know, people don't really have to carry around a lot of atmospheric conditions and uh, parameters for them to kind of gauge what's going on and make a decision. Invent traditions. Invent new fun traditions. Make it fun. We all say in energy efficiency, make it fun, easy, and convenient, um, and popular. And uh, really, if there's something that you guys can do to invent a new ritual or tradition, do it. Uh, pace lessons and innovations. Don't make people do everything all at once. And manage your expectations. Are you trying to get people to do something for you, uh, for a philosophy, for an ideology, or because you want a new outcome? Um, and that's some soul searching that has to happen, I think, because people really want people to do things for what they consider to be the right reasons and to do it the right way. And that kind of rigidity holds us back in whatever sustainability community we're working in uh, from really achieving true change. So, you know, uh, you can always email me, call me, or go to our website. And at www.acatripoli.org, we do have a lot of um, uh, consumer, transportation, um, building, appliance information. So there might be something that's relevant to you guys. Uh, log in. If it asks for your sector of interest, if you are interested in more behavior, click behavior. And get updates and invitations from our program and to follow my posts on our blog. And I am done. I'm ready to take some questions. Okay, we do. Actually, we have two questions. Um, the first is, any guesses what portion of the business population adopts technologies based slowly on information which demonstrates feasibility, suitability, and a positive return on investment? And then I'll turn uh, it. I'll, I'll go ahead and let you that answer that part. definitely outside of my purview. That one I okay. just have to pass on. Okay. I don't know about business at all. Um, and then alternatively, how much of the business population could be described as not adopting E2 because they're lacking a nudge with non-cognitive information, the changing norms, peer group action, things like that? Um, well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a business person, and I don't really research business per se. So we do have a paper on um, green work styles that talks a little bit about how people change behavior in organizations um, on the website, and it is gives several case studies about similarly stacked programs like the types I've discussed to get people to change energy consumption internally. Um, I don't know if that's at all helpful or relevant. There may be something that's relevant to you on the BEC, uh, BEC conference website. All of the presentations of most of the past uh, conferences are available on uh, BECC conference.org. So there's three C's in there, just make sure. Okay. And all the past conferences are archived, and we have done organization and management. But I think you're asking something that's a little bit outside of my purview. Okay, that helps. Um, and I, I was typing as you were talking, too, so that we could get that answer yep. captured. I see that. Yeah. Um, and then um, somebody else wondered if you would b discuss briefly assessment methods. How do you find out if it's working? <laughs> Oh, my Lord. Um, there's, uh, that is a big, big area in energy efficiency. It's called EM&B, um, Evaluation, Measurement, and Verification. And I don't know if you guys have the same title. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of different ways that people do this. And it actually is um, contingent. Uh, I'm going to answer this question two ways. The EM&B stuff is very specific to energy efficiency and savings through behavioral programs that have been instituted through utilities. And those are dependent on the specific regulatory environment of the state that they're in. And also of the sort of fiscal or organizational setup of the utility, whether it's a, a rural or municipal co-op, um, an investor-owned utility, or a, um, a public utility. 
And so all of those things depend on, on how they're trying to measure, what they're actually trying to, to achieve, and can swiftly kind of go into Arcana. Others is if you're really talking about the kind of community-based social marketing campaign, um, there are a variety of ways that you can do this. I mean, basic observation. I mean, in the Austin example, I mean, people did this campaign, and it was specifically targeted at dog waste, and they did the measurement at the parks, at the waterways near the dog waste, and saw a lessening. Now, how they might have gone about um, measuring the cost effectiveness of the program is a different question. Um, so again, it's going to depend a little bit when it, terms, when it comes to behavior on what outcome you're seeking, and then what that outcome is determines how you can measure it. I am not a big fan of measuring things post hoc with surveys, uh, but people do do it. Um, there's a whole other realm of interesting work as an anthropologist that I come out of, of and it's the garbage, in, the garbology with um, uh, Bill Rathje, who used to be at University of Arizona and now is at, I think, Emeritus at Stanford. And Rathje is R-A-T-H-J-E, and he has done extensive work in how can you follow up on people's um, answers to surveys and behavior change, behavior change instituted by the environment or economics, what they say to be true and what shows up in their garbage, what actually shows up. So we have a lot of different ways that you can measure impacts depending on the program and its outcomes and expectations. Okay. Um, yeah, and she, there was a follow-up. She wanted, and she said, "How how can you and how can you assess barriers?" Um, how can you assess barriers? Um, uh, I guess I need some more clarification on the question. I mean, so in the one of the first tests you need to do is to go out and actually be in the community where you're trying to affect change. And so several examples are actual physical barriers that if somebody is seated far away from the situation that's not necessarily going to know exists. Um, and I, um, I can't think of, I mean, the one that I gave you earlier, which is about the air conditioning, is a good example where, you know, you might have had an educational campaign in mind, but when you realize that that's not going to suit that community because they lack the ability to actually even physically manipulate their, their cooling, that would be a, a barrier that's assessed. Other barriers could be through focus groups or surveys. I mean, you could go out and ask people. Um, I'm a big fan, again, of ethnography, which means really letting people, you know, crafting some fairly open-ended questions, not terribly many. You can do in-home um, in -home interviews with a sampling of people who are in the community that you're looking for. Or you can do intercepts, which we did at the Great American Truck Show. And we were really interested in trucking owner operators and how they were uh, implementing energy efficient technologies and behaviors. And so we really just went, you have to go to where they are. I mean, you can't sort of send it out abstractly. But we went to the Great American Trucking Show and just hung out with them and talked to them. And these are five minute intercepts. But because people are very interested in talking about their situation, uh, they would extend to me 45 minutes easily. And you get a ton of information about what's going on. And so a good example being um, there's a smart way tire that people want to sell and that people have approved because it's highly fuel efficient, except it's a single tire as opposed to a double set of tires that truckers typically use. And the problem is if you're an owner operator and that tire blows, you are left stranded with no fleet organization behind you to save you. And so you have dire economic and potential safety consequences for adopting that tire that a fleet with a different set of economic situation doesn't have. So owner operators have different barriers to adopting certain types of energy efficient technologies than do the fleet managers who have a completely different systemic setup. So understand that's kind of what we mean by assessing barriers. Oh, Raph G passed away. That's so sad. I didn't know. Okay. Does anyone else have have questions? I'm not seeing any coming in. Um, so thank you, Susan, for, um, for a really interesting presentation. Um, as I said, we are recording this. 
Um, the archive um, is going to be available sometime tomorrow. Um, you'll all be getting a follow-up email um, with the link to the archive. Um, I do, before concluding today, want to encourage you to fill out the webinar evaluation. Um, a link will be included in the follow-up email. Um, this webinar is the first of a series on behavior change in social media, which is being sponsored by the Pollution Prevention Resource Exchange. Um, you can visit the P2RX website at p2rx.org for information about the other webinars in the series. Um, and those will be going on through spring, and we hope to keep that as a continuum.